Okay, so moving forward, keeping our eye on the time, it's member yeah. spotlight session. So, Lou, without further ado, who have we got today? Well, today, ladies and gents, we have Russell Parrott, Scott Woo! Duffield, and Emma Bateman. If you'd all like to come in, please, let's bring you in the room and start chatting. Hello. Hi. Hi guys. Hello. Hello. There you all are. Welcome, welcome, and welcome to Member Spotlight. Yes. Well so, done. Um, what we'll do first is it's a really relaxed environment. We've got a really lovely audience. So um, let's just start the ball rolling. And I'm going to just go around and just say your introduction and what is your business. Let's start with you, Scott. Hi, guys. Um, I'm Scott Duffield from the Home Solutions Group. We're a smart home integration company and electrical contractors. Um, yeah, basically, we give you your time back through automating your daily processes. Brilliant. Thanks. Yeah, good. Emma. Morning, everybody. So I'm Emma Bateman. Um, I run Red Roof Services. I provide specialised cleaning and inventories. Uh, my cleaning services are slightly more than domestic cleaning. So I start with end of tenancies up to trauma and hazard, uh, biohazard cleans. Wow. Okay. Thank you, Emma. And lastly, Russell. Hi, everybody. I'm Russell from Kubo Kitchens. Um, Kubo is sort of a design-led business uh, with a fresh approach to the whole kitchen buying process and designing process. I'm an independent, so I work with four different kitchen companies, two German, two English. Um, typically, I work with busy people who like to invest in their home, so uh, I like to take customers on a journey through the whole process. Brilliant. Right, thank you. Well, now you've introduced yourself. We know what you do. Let's get into the nitty gritty. We're going oh. into <laughs> we're, we're going into your past. So let's dig up what you've got in your past. I gave you some questions, but we're not going to use those questions. I'm no. kidding. <laughs> oh, no. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so um, yeah, just digging it a little bit into your past and just finding out, uh, you know, sort of why you chose this industry or sector or the niche that you're in. What what brought you to your industry? So um, should we start with you, Emma? Let's see what brought you to your industry or, um, in cleaning. Okay, so in the past, I think many do know, but my, my past previous career um, is, has basically been in care provision in many different areas from the old to the young or vice versa. Um, I trained originally um, on the NNEB. I don't think that even exists anymore now, feeling a bit old here with that. Um, yeah, and that, that career path took me into uh, management of care provision and so on. Uh, anybody that knows Trelaws in Alton, school and college for disabled people and young adults. So I was a deputy residential manager there uh, for 12 successful years. And within that, that was when I decided that actually I need to do something kind of a little bit more for me. Um, I could tell you so many facts about my staff teams, about the people that were in my care, but I got a little bit lost within it all. But I thought, well, what am I going to do? And for me, it was all about transferable skills. So if you can write a care plan on how to deal with somebody's life, um, and keep them healthy and well and, and detail that, then you can write a plan and a report on a home because that's a little bit easy really in comparison. Yeah. So I decided that I would take that and I started, initially I started inventory services and I started going into these properties and realizing that if, you know, I was a bit of the, I don't know, to quote Kim and Aggie, I had to critique on these things. So, Ooh, is, is, is that clean? And then I got thinking, wow. And I'd always had this little thing about, yeah, the, the how do you clean the extreme? Um, and I'm not, I'm not one of those funny TV watchers, you know, with to quote those programs, but it, it was always in my mind. So I went out and researched where I could train, how I could potentially do that, and added it to my services. And the business very, very quickly then grew, but I did a complete swap where the cleaning became the first and foremost, 
and the absolute recognizable and the infantries are just kind of the sit alongside and yeah so that's that's really where i am with it all um so it's like a, a, a natural progression really of, yeah, of building exactly. the basics and then springing into something that was ideal for you and worked for you it's really interesting yeah yeah really good thank okay. you yeah, what about you, Scott? How did you, um, why did you choose the industry that you're in? I started off working for Xerox, um, dismantling and putting photocopies back together way back in the day. And then that sort yeah. of just led down a path of, uh, of the electrical side. And um, once I entered that sort of space and was working in people's homes and stuff, started to come into contact with the, the um, older systems like the Crestron and that. I just thought, oh, quite like this. Quite like what they do and, and how, they, uh, how they benefit homeowners. And I think just the, the curiosity and the, the desire to learn all the cutting edge technologies is what's um, sort of pulled me more into that space. Um, I ended up starting a business just through working for companies that did out of the box solutions, one one size fits all, and sort of working places and think, well, actually, that doesn't really work. That's not what the customer's actually asking. It's not giving them the benefits that they require. And that's how we sort of started the, um, the Home Solutions Group. Right. And was it um, Sorry, goes to you. Sorry, Lou, I was going to say, I think the word why has been the downfall of many an employed person working for someone. They go, why are we doing it this way? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Was, it, was it something that you were interested in when you were young as well, though, um, uh, Scott, like tinkering with stuff and fixing stuff and that? Was it yeah, I've always, you've always been interested in? Yeah, I've always had that curious mind of why, why things work a certain way and how they work and like I've always enjoyed taking things things apart. Not always been successful in putting them back together again, but <laughs> it's it's always been something I've enjoyed doing. So um, and that's fundamentally how I ended up at Xerox as an engineer. Was, yeah. um, just tinkering with photocopies and stuff. Um, yeah, that, it's really it's really to me. It's really interesting when people um, you know choose um, a, you know a life choice about something that they're really interested in. It, it makes more of a success as opposed to be in a job that you're not really bothered or you're not really interested in. If you're interested in doing that so it gets you there, that's when you become successful, I think. I totally agree. And I think, especially in our industry, it's so fast paced. Um, I mean, five years ago, the technologies that we were installing then, some of them are, are, are now sort of obsolete or have moved on so far. The advancements are, yeah. are amazing. So it does, it just keeps you, keeps you interested. It does, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant, thanks. What about you, Russell? How did you get into kitchens? Well, going on really from what you were just saying, Lou, I sort of come out of college and stumbled upon a job and uh, went off and did two or three different types of jobs, really in the design um, RT, or AutoCAD industry and project management. And, and I got to about five years and thought, did I set out, did I plan to do this? How did I, how did I get here? And um, <clears throat> Is this what I want to do for the rest of my life? So I sort of had a bit of a, a rethink before it was too late, and uh, decided to uh, have a sort of a career change and retrain. Um, my father-in-law said to me, "Being an electrician, you earn loads of money." <laughs> Go, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I'm a bit of a creative. Um, I sort of love to do things with my hands and create. So I, I decided to do carpentry. So I did night school carpentry for three three years which was which was tough because it was at the end of the day on a Tuesday and Thursday and the Thursday was the theory so come 9 30 on a Thursday night it was it was very uh, hard to stay awake but um, I really enjoyed that and then yeah just um, off I went really started working with a kitchen company um, fitting I've been fitting for 10 years so carpentry tree is my trade um, so yeah that's really how it all come about and I sort of just, just trying to take it to the next level now I, I just want to point out to uh, everybody watching, um, that's not a virtual background behind Russell's, that's his actual <laughs> kitchen. <laughs> just in case you were wondering, we've that's all, his actual kitchen. We've all got kitchen envy, Russell, to be fair. <laughs> I've just broken into the uh, John Lewis down the road. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think it was because you got a job with a kitchen company, that's where your direction gone? Because to be fair, you, as a carpenter, you could have gone in a lot of different um, angles. Is that is that just, the, just by pure sort of coincidence that you landed up or did you always have a vested interest in kitchen? That's a very good question, Lou. Um, my father's actually was a carpenter by trade, so that sort of entered my um quite a bit. Um, but 
yeah, like I say, it's, it's working with the company sort of really confirmed. We did bathrooms as well, and I went off on a tangent with bathroom for a few years, um, but then sort of come back to the kitchens and the bedroom. Any, any, any sort of finishing um, carpentry is, is what, I like, what I like, so, yeah. Brilliant. Fantastic. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your honesty as well. It's always yeah. good to have that, but, you know, it's, it's, it's really good to hear from you know, from grassroots where people start and how, and how you get to where you are. And it's always a good icebreaker for networking to ask somebody, you know, what do you do? Oh, that's interesting. How did you get into that? Because yeah. everybody's got a story. And it's, I've always asked that question of people and I find it absolutely fascinating because it's never as linear as you think it is. They've done this, then they've done that. So fantastic for sharing. Um, I just want to come back to you, Emma. I want to ask you, uh, before you started, what one piece of advice do you wish you had been given before you got your business going? Oh, I don't know <laughs> if I can actually pinpoint one. Well, I you think I, one. <laughs> I really think that I, I would have liked the advisory and a little bit of coaching to actually say, this is how you're supposed to do it. There is a there is a method in all of this. I just went, I, I just threw myself into it. And I think anybody that knows me knows I'm a little bit impulsive sometimes. So it was just like, right, this is my idea and this is what I'm going to do. So I set up and um, it was it was hastily done. And I wish that I'd taken my time. Um, I did, I guess in the initial i went off um i think we all know i also love a little bit of training if there's some training to be done i'm in that room so you know the inventories i've trained to do those so that was that was my first step but actually setting up the business isn't all around training is it so yeah i think planning i should have had a lot more planning um at that stage as well um and i'm still learning about it all now which is why we're all at signal i guess well i i think it's a lifelong learning process you know i've spoken to people who have been right through had a very successful career and they're still learning stuff so but i, I hear the hear the planning thing to, so many times i've gone off you know you go oh that's a great idea and you sh rush off into it and if you'd have taken 10 minutes to think about what direction you're doing you could have saved yourself a lot more time down the road what about what about you, Scott? Any any words of wisdom that you wish you'd known about before you started? Yeah, I think very similar to Emma. Um, I think if, if you was asking me what I tell somebody setting up a, a business now is surround yourself with successful and ambitious people. Um, join a mastermind group and learn from other people's experiences and save yourself um, mm -hmm. some of the heartache I know I've been through in the, in the, the time I've been a business owner, um, and that 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 knowledge is, is invaluable. Um, and from that, you learn so much so much more. And I think it's also, it's important to be around people that have got the right mental attitude as well, that they want to drive themselves forward and they, they tend to drag people along along with them rather than surrounding yourself with naysayers and, oh, you don't want to do that. You want to stay employed, you get a job for life. Uh, those things are long gone. So I think having people around you that are successful and are ambitious and, and positive is, is a, is a no-brainer yes i think we we cover that in in jumpstart january don't we who you mix with matters and i think it re i think you've got a really valid point there if you surround yourself with with you know like-minded people you kind of go on a journey together so yeah really key point scott I, I love it when somebody asks me to uh they challenge my preconceptions so i say something and they're like oh that's interesting why do you say that because it makes you stop and think and go yeah, why do I think that? Uh, that can be that can be really really useful. What about yourself, Russell? What what would you have wanted to have known before you started? It's not good going last because all the good answers get taken up. Uh, <laughs> we, mix it what, up. we will mix it up. I'm going to echo what the uh, other guy said really, and listen to people that have been there um, because you you go into business thinking that you're invincible and you're just going to come out with a successful business and yeah, it, it, it doesn't quite work like that. Like Scott said, if you, um, someone like Signal, absolutely amazing. You just surround yourself with sound advice all the time. It's, it's great. Um, don't employ staff willy-nilly. Um, 
I, when the bathroom side of my business took off, I, I think I employed six staff and I bought four vans and I shot up like a rocket and then straight back down again sort of thing. But there was no plan to it. I was just trying to go with the flow and, oh, we're getting busier. Right, let's, let's, and it just all unraveled. Um, so yeah, have a, have a plan, have a growth plan and really, really stick to it. Um, and if your competition are doing it, don't do it is, is some, some advice that I wish I'd have taken heed many years ago. So. Wow. That, that, yeah. That's some great advice right there. Excellent. Um, let's just talk about your in industry specifically now. I'm going to ask you each a question about your, your specific industry. So, uh, Russell, I'll start with you because obviously you've asked for that. So we'll give you what you want. <laughs> what um, piece of advice would you um, give somebody starting out in your industry? If there's anybody out there that wants to start, you know, started a kitchen company, what piece of advice would you give them? I think I'm just going to run through two or three quick ones. Um, don't be afraid to talk about the customer's level of investment. Don't, 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 the elephant in the room is English people. We're, we're funny about um, uh, how much we want to spend and we keep our cards close to our chest. But when I talk to a customer, I sort of insist that we, we talk about, I don't like to use the word budget, but, but that's really the word. Um, don't be afraid to charge for design work. There's, uh, I think people that don't charge for design don't really take care over it. And there's loads of companies that will do it. And if that's what the customer wants, then they can go off and get a free design from there. So please don't be afraid to charge for, for your design. And um, find real decent fitters because they're your forefront and um, look after them really is a, is a, is a good, good, good thing to follow, I think. That's, yeah, really good advice. And you're right. None of us like talking about money, do we? I don't know why. I don't know why. We just, you know, it's good to be upfront. And the design work is a really key thing as well because so many of, you know, the, 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 the big stores say, come in and we'll do it all for free and blah, blah, blah. But yeah, you're, you're more niche than that. So charge for your time, definitely. And that's great. That works for some. It's horses. Exactly. For that's yeah. What people want. That obviously works. I'm not going to question no, that. No, no. But it's not what you are. That's really good. No. What about you, Emma, in, the, in your industry? So if I was going to advise anybody now, and I'm going to focus on the cleaning here, um, I wouldn't actually advise anybody to go straight into the biohazard and trauma cleaning without some other experience first so starting off maybe more domestic level um end of tenancy working up through the commercials straight away i'd say do your groundwork homework first get out there look at some of the local suppliers or even those that might be further afield investigate the products and get the um yeah get the the housekeeping in first there is so much that um you you can it can unravel very quickly for example if you haven't got safety data sheets get your cosh in order and that sort of thing um the risk assessments and sort of that all all the background stuff if you start out there first of all you're cleaning and you haven't got that it's going to unravel um yeah, yeah that's really good so it's all about foundation isn't it it's, it's yeah. kind of getting yeah. a foundation totally. have a solid foundation and your building will stand that's kind of what they say so yeah that's yeah. really good advice yeah. yeah what about you scott in your industry i'd say our industry is so vast pick the area you're going to specialize in and right. concentrate on that first before you try to do everything and become a master of one area as opposed to a, a jack of all trades across the whole lot and then once you once you've picked your area work out what, it, what benefit you're going to bring to a customer and what problems you're solving for that customer and focus on them as opposed to, I think it's very easy in our industry to just get sidelined and sidetracked by all the, the bells and whistles and people want to put in the big fancy cinemas, etc. cetera. Um, I think you can, you can get a better sustainable business by solving people's problems within the industry as opposed to um, just sort of jumping around trying to do everything. And I, I echo what Russell says, don't don't employ people for the sake of it. I've been down the same sort of path as what Russell has at Ten Blokes working for us at one point. And what I'd say is find the, find decent staff first, and preferably before you actually need them, so you have a pool of people that you can turn to when you need to start growing. Um, yeah. Sparks are to a penny. Decent sparks are really hard to find. Yeah, I agree with that. But just going back to picking as a specialist area. 
do not need to do all the areas first so you know what your spe how do you work out what your specialist area is going to be is there an element of trying a few things and seeing what works for you or you're more interested in how, how does that how does that work for you yeah i suppose <laughs> I mean, a lot of that you'll pick up through your apprenticeships. If you if you're doing an apprenticeship with a decent company, um, more often than not, you'll you'll get a, a varied um, degree of education across that. Um, but really, that part of that supposed to does depend on where you where you choose to do your apprenticeship with. If you do your, your apprenticeship with someone like National Rail or, or British Cash, you're going to learn more of their systems than than anything else. But it is such a varied varied industry. Um, yeah. from, you know, small domestic and stuff like we do, the smart homes up to the, the big industrial sites. You know, we've, we've over our uh, lifetime, we've done it, done it all. But, you know, I'd say the hardest to do homework first and find an area that you, you're more comfortable with, what, what excites you and, and what keeps you interested. Brilliant. Yeah. OK, thank you for that. Just um, in the chat, uh, Wendy has put a comment in saying, I always say every day is a school day. You never stop learning. And, that, and that's so true. If anybody else um, wants to put questions to, um, to the panel, please put them in the chat. We'll, you know, we'll, it's, it's an interactive session, guys. So if anybody wants to ask anything or say anything, put it in the chat and we'll, <laughs> and we'll surprise them with a question. That's always fun. <laughs> Ever answer them. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Scott. <laughs> oh, um, <dear. laughs> So I would echo what you said about uh, your employees. Um, you know, they really can make and break your business. So employ the very best people and nurture them, definitely. I think on that, sorry, just quickly on that, I think with employees, it's more important to find staff that have got good people skills that can interact with a customer. You can teach them the technical side of the job. You can't necessarily teach somebody to be good with customers. Yeah. 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 It, it, does come down to building that rapport and if somebody doesn't do that and they're not natural at it it can make the difference even if the, the work is technically the same as somebody who does have those skills you'll get a much better response from the customer if you, if you have built that relationship and you've got a much better chance of them referring you and if those people are on the front line and they're they're the front facing staff yeah investing in time and effort and finding the right people definitely i would definitely agree with that so, uh, Scott, describe a typical day in your business. Is there a typical day? Not really. Um, <laughs> most of the day spent on site um, discussing jobs with either the clients or with staff. Um, that takes up the majority of my day. And then the evening tends to be doing the stuff working on the business, so quoting, invoicing, research, etc. But yeah, there's no such thing as a typical day, I don't think, in, in our. Uh, and try to <laughs> okay uh what about you russell um i suppose like any small business owner you know you see the clown at the circus that's riding around on the unicycle and and spinning the plate and playing the trumpet it's it's like that there's there's uh, i'm based in the office generally now so uh design work takes up 50 percent of my time i would say um quoting um following up materials but then there's visiting site visiting the, the guys on site making sure talking to the customer that sort of thing and generally project managing um ordering materials creating schedules all that all that sort of thing involved in running projects i suppose yeah okay yeah and emma what about you is there a typical day if so what does it look like what's a typical day i mean i'm like russell there i'm i'm the one that just runs around <laughs> what's going on um I'll get an example of a day last week i was asked to do um a, a builder's clean so there was a, a nice barn conversion thing going on and yeah i i was expected to arrive i was expected to have the whole property to myself i mean with consideration that we are still in a covid19 situation it didn't go like that at all um i arrived to find three painters still on site to find that 10 minutes after me the mastic man turned up and like how am I supposed to clean this if you're doing that? And, and we're now all trying to socially distance and all trying to, and it was just ridiculous. <laughs> but you have to manage it. 
and then you know from there i can be in the most perfect of perfect jobs which is lovely and then i go to like as scott has already said where that that day just turns into you you know you've done your bit on site and then you can come home or to the office or wherever we are working these days and do the paperwork and the quotes and whatever and then for me it goes a little bit awry again because i can turn up to a job which i think is going to be very standard start cleaning and actually think no this job is now turning from standard to complete hazard mm -hmm. and it's then stop reassess all those risk assessments come into place how are we going to deal with this and you just it wow it, it it's like liquid work liquid mercury it, there's never there's nothing typical nothing <laughs> So I'm going to ask you a question now, which is kind of forward thinking. And this is always good. I think this is a good question answer to say out loud, because this really lets you like use your imagination as to where you actually want to be. So I want you, Russell, to start to say, describe an ideal day in your business. And this will really show us where you want to be going forward. Um, good question. <laughs> um, I suppose really I quite like the designing side, the survey design um, and the, the creating the visuals and, and that sort of selling side of the business. So in answer to the question, that would be where I'd like to be. And perhaps as soon as that orders on, orders in, um, on the deposits paid, I'd like to pass it down to a team member that could then, a trusted team member that could almost manage the job. And I would oversee and sort of visit the client maybe at the end or halfway through. Um, and that's really quite like, where I'd like to head, but you've got to get there slowly. Like I said before, you can't. But it's just... achievable, right? It is. Yeah, it's achievable so. to get to that, definitely. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Brilliant. What about you, Scott? What's your ideal day look like? A boat moored off the Greek island somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> now, I think, like you Russell said, I... going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I think, like Russell said, I, I really do enjoy the interaction with the customer um, and going through the design process of the system from trying to find out exactly what they're trying to achieve and then come up with the solutions to do that. Um, and very similar to Russ, I think that would be my ideal days to spend the time with the customers and then come back and spend the time with the team designing um, solutions for them and yeah. then moving on to the next project. Brilliant. And you, Emma? I think my ideal day would be literally get up, go and do whatever the clean or whatever it is that I've got to do work with my team and I say team I do have some casual staff now as and where needed um work with them work alone depending on what the job may be but yeah get the cleans done that's where I get my kicks I love I love that that end clean um and then yeah to actually be able to come home shut my door and not have to worry about the rest of it um and not be as again going back to russell's um clown on the unicycle with all the things that i i yeah that would be my ideal is not to be that person anymore yeah really i mean that's a resounding sort of similarity that you all have it's, it's, it's pretty much take yourself off the tools elevate yourself up um the key there though i think it has to be said is again your team you have to have a yes. good team that has the same ethos as you as the same presentability as you because that's when it begins to fall down so i think it's really key yeah. to build a good team so yeah in the pudding, really definitely sorry lou if i can i would actually they like to be the other way i would like to be on the tools and forget everything else oh, i okay. yeah yeah i'd i'd rather have somebody actually doing this office stuff i can't stand it i, I really can't it's the bit that I say I'm I'm better off out there, and that's where my skill set is, um, and that's that's really what I do. So okay. yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm slightly slightly, slightly the other way. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, and it's achieve. I mean, everything that you say is achievable, right? Um, it yeah. definitely is. It's it's gross in different in in different ways. I mean, you know, you could you know, Emma, have a company that dealt with all of the admin and all of that for you. You know, that that. That's not um, a difficult thing to hand over to somebody, is it? I mean, no. A, a soft introduction to that would be possibly to get a VA 
exactly. to look after things, answer the phone and know, yeah. get to feel the rhythm of what your business is so that if you do have to employ someone, that VA could then perhaps brief you on what skills to look for in the employee. Yeah. But yeah. Just a thought, just, just yeah. chucking the ideas out there. Um, moving forward, looking into the future. So we've, we've looked back, we've had a chat about what's going on now, looking into the future. Scott, what are some of your life goals? What do you want to achieve? What I want to achieve? Yeah. Um, I suppose my, my ultimate goals is, is to provide a, a steady uh, and good lifestyle for my family and my kids um, in terms of materialistic stuff. I think like most people, would like to, I'd love to be mortgage free. Um, we'd love to have a nice holiday home out in Zante um, and possibly get a boat. And that's, that's where I'm heading in. And that's what I want for uh, myself and the family just to be stress free really and finance add to financial freedom i think like most people to do what, what we want to do yeah so build your business up as an asset and either have somebody manage it for you that you oversee or sell it on and then invest the the result yeah yeah okay so it's, it's it's achievable that's the thing it's not you're not saying you know i want to run the world you're saying i just want a little slice of it that's mine that's stress-free that's great what about you, Russell? What's your life goals? Yeah, I suppose um, very similar to Scott again, build up a sort of a business that's a saleable system or model um, per se. Maybe I don't like the word franchise because that sort of seems to be national network big, but um, maybe something like that. And I think that I can do that now, whereas three years ago I was all over the show and and didn't really have but um didn't really have the, the process in place but I'm building up on that so um like Scott I, the usual really ret retire early if, if possible um but never come completely away from it but just take a step back um but for the time being a lifestyle business would be good um just just I like the fact that the, I can still be with the kids whilst they still want to know me really um so yeah okay and uh em what about you what what's your uh what are your life goals i think really similar um i mean unlike scott and russell i think as we all know i don't have children so i don't have little people to worry about it's just pretty much me and you know mark back there so you know to to carry on with the business i enjoy it i love it the to have to have that financial stability to to just sort of do what I want when I want to do it if that is holidays home yeah get that new kitchen in um or or whatever that may be um and yeah just be really comfortable and I think it's yeah it's not it's not sort of big or flashy it's I think I've got quite a humble outlook on things really there's no no sort of other designs to like you say rule the world it's just to have that that little place and continue continue doing what i'm doing basically fair enough that's you know having a little slice of your own uh, uh, heaven is perfectly acceptable um but it's knowing what you want that allows you to set the goals to drive towards it Right, well, we've all been in these um, difficult times over the last 12 weeks. It's been challenging and different and our goals may be slightly different and, and our business may have slightly, you know, changed and tweaked. But this just, um, just wanted to ask you what um, if there are any um, opportunities in your sector or industry at the moment? Has anybody looked at your industry and said, right, what opportunity have I got now? So um, let's start with you, Russell. Is there any opportunities that you, you can see in your industry at the moment? I think so, yeah, definitely. Um, people have had a lot of time at home, so they, they've been looking at that space that they're thinking, we must really get that sorted out. Um, so, so kitchens and, and bedrooms perhaps organise themselves um, in that respect. But also, looking at the other side of things, if you've spent so much time at home, you might be getting a divorce. So that's two kitchens. That's a kitchen in one flat and a kitchen in another. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, just that sort of thing, really. People at home offices, uh, people are going to be working from home more. We do the odd home office. So that's something that I can offer, make that space comfortable for you rather than on the dining room table with the kids running around and the, all that sort of thing going on. So, yeah. 
I mean, it's really important, isn't it, to look look for opportunities out of, you know, that's what we do, right? I mean, I, I agree. We've used our kitchen so much more in the last 12 weeks because you're just, you know, in your house all the time cooking. So, yeah, um, I agree. I think we've been here a long time in our houses and we've seen a lot of flaws in our houses that we don't normally see because you're just kind of like, yeah, you're too busy. So, yeah. yeah, definitely an opportunity. What about you, Scott? Are there any opportunities in your, in your industry at the moment? Yeah, I think there is, uh, uh, to echo... Uh, sounds like we're doing this most of the, most of the morning, but um, I think with a lot more people working from home, I think a lot of people have realised that actually it's quite sustainable for them to work from home. So we're seeing the opportunities to um, upgrade people's like internet um, infrastructure, Wi-Fi, um, increase their their electrical system so they can uh, they can actually have a, a small space for themselves within the house, or they've got their external offices being built by companies like Russell's, and um, there's always the opportunity there to to the wiring etc so i think that's definitely become more prevalent over the next few months what about um in in the and the care industry because um you're involved in that as well is there a big upsurge in that that people don't want to go possibly don't want to go into care homes anymore and think the solutions at home might be better because i know that you're involved in that as well aren't you yeah i think there will be definitely um with the locks on wireless system we can um, we can give people assisted living control so you can you can keep an eye, an eye effectively on, on elderly loved ones without having to sort of intrude on their, their privacy. I think that's, that's definitely going to be, um, be on the uptake uh, moving forward. Well, yeah, well, I would think so because of the problems that we have had in, in the care homes. I mean, you know, we've had a lot of deaths in care homes. So people might be a little bit more reluctant or stay at home longer, possibly, with the help of the solutions that you can do. I would, I would see that as a big opportunity for you. Yeah, I think it's not just the care homes. I think just generally people who have got parents who live quite, quite a way away, um, whereas before it would have been nice to have been able to make sure they were OK with the systems that we can provide through their, their um, daily routine interruptions, etc. I think more people are, are going to start to look at that and think, well, especially as we have the uncertainty of how long um, social distancing, etc., is going to stay in place. Yeah. Especially with people self children as well, you know, the elderly are, they're, they're more, more vulnerable and they are tending to want to lock themselves away. So by being able to have a remote system that doesn't sort of Im have a direct impact on their daily life, but will allow, allow you to, to make sure that they're okay and that they're, yeah. they're up and they're moving about, is yeah, it's definitely, definitely going to be opportunities there for us. I see a big advertising campaign coming our way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Emma? Yeah. This, the cleaning industry has been one that through COVID-19, it, it really is quite divided now. Uh, back right at the start of COVID, um, I, I did some significant COVID cleaning. We, um, you know, the whole full white suit thing, similar to what's behind me and the respirators. And, you know, that was really, really serious cleaning. Um, Unfortunately, within all of that, um, there was a boom in cleaning businesses that just the, it, the people erupted into cleaning all over the place. And unfortunately, that is that has put a lot of cleaners on a on one foot a stable road and on the other foot a very very rocky road. And we don't really know where this is going. So I, I'm kind of. Um, yeah sort of in in between at the moment i think future it it could be really really good but we it's yet to be seen unfortunately um i think unfortunately uh we know that we focused as as within signal we focused on that that whole topic of pivoting and unfortunately but the cleaning industry took a lot of people where they pivoted into cleaning as well they were doing some significant cleaning where there was a lot of bad 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 practices there was a lot of desperate people out there who were also undercutting significantly what cleaning prices should be in that area they were putting themselves at risk they were putting others at risk so there's still quite a lot of tarnishing going on there's there's all sorts so for us it's it's uh yeah it's a it's a strange still very much a strange time uh with yeah quite a bit of uncertainty really i think that but, actually builds in an opportunity because there's always going to be a backlash reaction to opportunists coming into a marketplace because mm -hmm. people will get dissatisfied with either poor performance 
or uh, substandard results. And that gives you an opportunity to keep your prices strong and say, well, you get what you pay for. Yeah, yeah, literally. Um, and I think it, it, this is a little bit maybe of a, a sort of a long, longer game at the moment. Yep. You know, people Absolutely. people have to realise that if, yeah, I think there's a there's a phrase or a saying, you know, pay, pay cheap, pay twice. Yeah. Certainly, certainly yes, because it, you know, the health and the safety and the backlash of the, the effect of, on somebody's health are, you know, you, it's not worth gambling with, really. Exactly. No. Well, we've only got a couple of minutes left, so I just want to do a quick fire round. Um, have you got anything planned? What's the most exciting thing you've got planned for your business coming up? Let's start with you, Scott. Have you got anything exciting planned? Anything exciting plans in terms of projects or where we're going with the business? Yeah, projects, anything. What's the most exciting um, thing you've got planned? Yeah, we've, <laughs> we've got quite an, quite an exciting project coming up over in um, Hazelmere soon. Um, a nice six bed house, fully all made of cinema. Um, oh. Quite looking forward to getting stuck into that, to be completely honest. Is that the same project that, that Gary was talking about earlier? Nope. <laughs> it's a completely no. different one, yeah. Little this is a new bill coming straight out. Wow. Brilliant. What about you, Russell? Have you got anything exciting planned in the business? Um, well, uh, I offer kitchens to everyone. I've got, I've got kitchens from five grand up to 50 grand, and I really want to look at the five grand and the, the lower end of the market and maybe um, produce like a Shopify internet buying uh, platform. Not sure, but I'm quite excited about thinking about if it, if it can work or not. So. We'll have a conversation about that. <laughs> All right, Mister. <laughs> he comes in like from above. We'll have a conversation. Oh, on it. On it. <laughs> collaboration. It's collaboration. Collaboration. Man. Brilliant. And Emma, have you got anything exciting planned in the near future for business? Um, I'm. I'm just. <laughs> Me personally, I'm looking into more training. Um, I want to further my trauma cleaning training, and yeah, ta I want to. Yeah, there's a there's a lot to happen there, but I don't want to grace you all out. No, so. I think I think that um, <laughs> in the future, businesses, specifically uh, medical and uh, and allied industries, are going to really want qualified people who are at the top of their game and will just have to pay for it and, and soak it up because uh, they can't afford you know could, could you imagine a care home having a massive outbreak of, of proportions that we've seen with covid with something else just decimates their business so i i, I think yeah. you've got the right kind of attitude of it is a long game this, this yeah. isn't going away anytime yeah. soon and it's just going to make people more um willing to spend money on the right hygiene you know mcdonald's are advertising we're open and we've increased cleaning it's like well what were you doing beforehand <laughs> what were you getting away with <laughs> to, be, to be fair to them they've actually increased their cleaning products so I, I know. you know but I know, i'm being facetious i i, I know <laughs> <laughs> well no what what an amazing uh amazing answers and um, amazing stories that we've had from our our members today uh, just thank you very much for sharing thank you very Scott, did you want to add something we yeah just quickly i think emma's got a, an opportunity there to to um put herself at the forefront with education on on forwards um what's actually involved in doing the cleaning properly and i think if you, if you start to educate people and explain this is exactly what we need to do people will make their own mind up well how can companies be doing that so cheap then and i think you yeah well better make your pricing more solid or just by giving start that the training or start your own training company to train people how to do it properly well that that was also an option and yeah still one that i'm kind of looking into and thank you for that because um yeah again training last year i did that education certificate exactly. train the trainers train people yeah, yeah. i'm sorry right. to cut across this this flow of ideas but we have run out of time and it would be remiss me to let it trickle on because i'm sure we could keep talking for another half an hour another hour we've got a session after this where we're going to be looking at sales and improving yourselves thank you very much i know you can't hear it but ladies and gentlemen give them a round of applause go on
Ah, it's been really <laughs> lovely to talk to all of you and thank you so much for your honesty. It, it really has been great. I've really enjoyed my morning. Thank you for that. Okay, so okay. that's the end of the spotlight session. Uh, we're going to have a quick 10 minute break as always. Um, so we'll see you in part two. The links should be sent out. If you haven't had a link, email Gareth now and he'll email it back to you. And you should have had the workbook. Again, if you haven't had it, look in your inbox, email Gareth and he'll get it to you. I'll see you in 10 very short minutes. Thank you very much, Scott. Thank you very much, Emma. Thank you very much, Russell. And I'll see you too after the break, Lou. See you later. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.